Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. Today, our discussion focuses on nonprofits that help to build confidence, support, and opportunities for AAPI youth. My special guests today are Vanessa Leung, co-executive director at the Asian American Coalition for Children and Families in New York, and Kyle Kafai Chan, uh, program director of the Community Youth Center of San Francisco, and Lua Pritchard, executive director at the Asia Pacific Cultural Center in Washington. Thank you all for joining us. This is just a wonderful, wonderful discussion, uh, particularly during uh, this month. It is May is Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Islander Heritage Month. And we're celebrating the achievements of these very diverse communities in the United States by talking with you and being informed by your experiences so that we all collectively can share the the wisdom that that you're going to bring to us. So so be wise. I'm depending on you. Um, And and Vanessa, let's let's start with you as as uh, as a knowledge holder and a and and an expert in your part of the world. Talk a little bit about what it means to be Asian American in the United States today, where we are having um, outbreaks, as we have periodically through our history, um, of hateful uh, uh, language, uh, hateful acts, uh, alienating conduct. How do we, we, uh, first of all, understand the experience of what it means to be Asian, right, which is just this huge, diverse community, um, and and how do we ensure that America embraces us all? Yeah. So um, CACF, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, we are here in in, in New York, um, and we are, you know, as a coalition, we we work across the diverse Asian American community, and I think oftentimes. Um, we constantly have to remind folks about that the community is not a monolith and that when we are seen as as a monolith, it it actually erases the beautiful diversity of our community, um, you know, for groups that are from, from East, you know, track their heritage from East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. We also work with groups in in our coalition that work with Central Western Asian communities here in New York. Um, We, 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 embrace the, the term of uh, Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community with really knowing that our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities are smaller here in, in New York, but we wanna also signal that we are open and willing to learn um, from that diversity and learn from and um, understand the needs um, because there are, there are folks who do identify. And for, for us, it's always been about um, data, and information on our communities. So CACF for quite some time have been looking at how do we have better quality data on our community when when information is not collected or we are just categorized as Asian, the needs and the inequities um, and the rich histories that our communities bring are often lost. Um, So our our needs are erased, our communities are invisible. Um, and therefore, we can't have a proper community response to those needs or a proper policy response. Well, as soon as you homogenize people under a, under a heading, right, you're, you're, you're not doing justice. As a matter of fact, and, and I want to recognize this, the very fact that we're having this discussion can be viewed as offensive by some and legitimately viewed as offensive by some, right? The, the fact that, that we look at Americans and we make distinctions based in in race or ethnicity, where we should actually be Americans with pride in, in each of our different heritages. But we have a problem in this country, right? We have an issue that if we don't talk about it, we're, we're kind of bad if we do it down, we don't. And, and in talking about it is, is, is so much better. Kyle, could you give us your take from, from where you are in terms of this really complicated issue? And then Lou, I'd love to uh, chat with you and, and uh, just sort of be informed by each of your sensibilities, and then let's let's really jump into the kind of uh, programs that you're advancing, Kyle. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. First and foremost, thank you for having us. It's an honor to be on this panel with all the panelists here on AAPI Heritage Month. Uh, to answer your question, which is a very tough question to, to start off with, I think Asian Americans have been in this country for many, many years, and we have a very complex and scope of immigration into this country. We've been coming in as sojourners, as paper sons, as high tech workers, as refugees, as undocumented immigrants, and even recently as tech workers, right? But like everyone was saying in this panel, we're still pretty much invisible. We're still gaslighted into believing that we don't belong here. And like you said, conversations like this can be offense, uh, can be uh, triggering for some, can be offensive for some, but at the end of the day, it's important. And what we do here at CYC Community Youth Center in San Francisco is we welcome tough conversations, right? We embrace tough conversations because in order for us to, to proceed forward, to move forward into society, I think we need to talk about topics like this. And in a very cancel-like culture where everything's getting canceled immediately, like, hey, I'm walking on eggshells when I'm talking about this, I'm afraid to talk about this, I think we need to embrace tough conversations and welcome people and, and start talking about things that's not often talked about so we could get our history, get our narrative out there for, for people to see. We must be assertive, right, Lua? We have to be assertive. It is it is great work that needs to continue um, and even paid more attention to because that's the problem. Uh, often in the past, um, for example, there are so many important things like voting, for example. Uh, who who does America bring up uh, next to mainstream America is the Hispanic Latinx. Uh, God bless them all because you know we we are there are partners and there are people too. But um, uh, but Asian Pacific is never in the in the questions in many many different ways. So and but yet they eat our foods. Um, you know, they, they're with us and, and they love our foods. They love our entertainment. But they, it, it's when it talks about big subject matters, uh, especially where funding is concerned, we're often forgotten. And, and, and then they, because they don't understand who we are and how many of us and how different we are from each other, they have no clue. So they lump us together for many different ways. And that's why we're... We're working so hard and been working so hard in trying to disaggregate our data, not just Asian Pacific from each other, but Asians from each other and Pacific Islanders from each other, because we are all lumped together in so many different ways. But yet we are so different from each other um, and we have similarities. People don't know that, but but we also have beautiful differences and well, people need other people need to know who we are. And you make reference to uh, to it could be called pejoratively cultural appropriation or honoring a culture, but without being informed by its origins, right? Benefiting from from um, a cross fertilization that is happening now through the internet and through through the fact that we are, as you said, through the foods and so on and so forth. But it is it is so much a richer experience when you actually recognize the distinctions and the uh, glorious cultures that brought us those flavors, right? That, that, uh, that created those, um, those, um, those plants that, that now are, are distinctive and, and becoming part of the, for example, the California economy, right? That, that are being grown and are, are being sold worldwide. Let's talk a little bit about this, this issue in, in general, because as you referenced, Lua, there are uh, partners that have their type of experience, but in a very similar uh, vein. And Gail Kong, my former and forever uh, boss, um, just, just raised that question. Have community organizations, have you all hosted um, uh, discussions with others who have the same experience as you referenced, Lua, um, and have you tried to galvanize um, joint efforts surrounding this idea of defining America, honoring different cultures, sharing knowledge and that? And uh, Vanessa, I'll give, uh, since, since you're nodding so vigorously, uh, why don't we go over to you and then Kyle, if you could also weigh in um, and, and let's do a little bit of a free for all, because this is such a very important question that Gail asked. Yeah, I mean, I think 
a lot of the work that we're doing has to be done in collaboration and in coalition with other mm-hmm. communities of color. Oftentimes, we our fight has always been around uplifting the those most marginalized within the AAPI community here in New York City that are often so erased by the model minority myth. Um, and so, our talk concern, about the model minority myth. Yes. I know we, we've heard it, but. Talk about what what is the model minority? What what is it to be a model minority? Well, you know, in essence, it's it's this almost innate ability to be successful in this country. That it's almost like through this hard work that it is kind of a um, often a given that our community will be successful. And we know that at the end of the day, that's so harmful not just for the Asian American community because it erases the struggles um, and the challenges that. Right, that face our communities and actually says like, why do we need to invest in that community if they're doing so well? But it also has been used, um, our community has been used as a wedge um, to, you know, to justify underinvestments in other communities um, of color, particularly. And so, you know, this is, it often seems to be like, oh, that's a nice thing to be like, oh, you're a model, but. Well, also don't, don't vote, just be a model minority. Don't raise your voice, just be a model minority. Yes. And by the way. Put your head down, work hard. Right. And ignore, ignore the issue of, of, of poverty and suicide amongst, uh, amongst uh, particularly amongst older women in, in, in certain communities. It's basically ignoring it, it, it gives license to ignore because, you know, everything will work out. And by the way, don't don't talk. And, you know, that kind of it, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, Kyle, um, what were you going to say? Sorry, Mark, if I could jump in, because I think with the model minority myth, one of the one of the talking points that gets often overlooked is aside from the limiting of resources to AAPI communities, it's also how it's used to pin other racial groups against us. Right. So it's like the Asian folks are coming in to take our jobs. The Asian foods are coming in to to gentrify us, to take our houses. But reality is we are facing the same same struggles that any other minority groups are facing. And on top of that, another point that's often mute and not talked about is the underreporting of AAPI communities. I grew up in a family where we don't trust the government and people don't talk about that, right? They think that, oh, if things happen, we automatically go to the cop. But culturally, we're trained to keep things in-house, to not bring shame to the family and not talk about it with others. So that's often not talked about with the AAPI community. You know, uh, Lua, you are also nodding vigorously. Did you have a point that you wanted to uh, make in particular about this this topic? Well, that's why disaggregating data is so important. That's why we're working so hard, have been working so hard, and still will continue to work hard because there are always people. And plus, oh my gosh, government takes so long to do something. And so we've been begging and begging to get our data straightened up. And even in in uh, the census uh, data, because we're so undercounted as well, uh, we're never considered uh, up there in the in the big numbers uh, because we're always undercounted. But I think everybody is undercounted for that reason. But we feel so um, undercounted because I feel because of our language and cultural barriers, we're, we're extra undercounted uh, for those matters and immigration issues as well. So that's why it's so important to disaggregate the data because there's so many of us who are poor and in poverty and uh, failing in school and, you know, and not making it and not going to college and, and not getting the right jobs and, and, and so forth. And so that's why data is so important. Very, very important. There's also a matter of, of defining America. Can we, can we talk a little bit about what America is, because there is this this issue. You've, you've heard about the great replacement theory, right? Where you have a huge number, a third of the population believe in, in, in this nonsense, right? And so we have to start thinking about America differently. How do you think about America, Lua, in terms of, of what America is and what America should be and that delta? You know, when I was growing up, there was always this thing, you know, it's, America is a dream place to go to. But then you come here and you grow up and and you and you experience so much hate, so much racism, so much 
violence and so forth. Um, and is this the dream place that I that I grew up to uh, want to be at? But we're here. And we, we come to the United States of America because we want to make something out of us. But that's the other stereotype that America has on us, is that they think that we came here just to get something hand down to us. Well, for Asia Pacific people I can only speak for, we're hardworking people. We do not want uh, hand downs to us. We want to earn them. And so we want, you know, we, we work so hard to get, and, and that's the other thing. That's the, there's so much stereotyping of who we are. People hate us for the wrong reasons. And, and, and they're, they're thinking that we came here, just like what Kyle said, we came here to take things from, from people here. Well, you know, as we learn more and more and get educated, everybody came here. You know, we're all immigrants. And what makes you different from any of us? We came here for the opportunity to learn more and to be someone, you know, to leave, to live and to, and, uh, and to make that dream come true. And yeah, we help our people back home. And so what? That's love. That's the love of a family. And, and we deserve to do that because we came here to do that, to get that dream going, you know, well, to you be educated and to get something going. So you just described every American and uh, Native uh, community of the lower 48, Native communities of Alaska and Hawaii, um, of, of American Samoa. You've described people who work hard, who want to be part, who yeah. want to help their families, wherever those yeah. families may live international, uh, nationally. Uh, Kyle, what is your take on, on what it means to be um, part of this country and also um, the experience, if you could describe uh, your take on the experience of the different generations. In my family, uh, my father came as a refugee, uh, so I, I guess that would make me the first um, in, on his line who was born in the United States. Um, and if you go through all of our, our folks uh, that I know, those stories that Lua was just talking about, it's ubiquitous. Um, uh, talk a little bit about your take on that, on that question. Absolutely. I could share a lot of similarities that I just heard. Uh, I immigrated to the United States when I was around eight years old. Uh, immediate culture shock once I got off the plane. I haven't seen so many people of different color. Uh, I came in the early 90s from Hong Kong, China. Uh, and immediately after that culture shock came a strong desire to fit in as a young person. And largely because at home, when I got to the United States, my parents was no longer home as often as they were back back in China. They were working long, long hours just to find, you know, make make ends meet. Uh, and and I think one thing that wasn't talked about or that isn't talked about about the whole immigration process is resentment from the child to the parent. As a child, I did not want to come to the United States. I was eight. I had friends back home. Mm -hmm. I had a, a developed routine that I was accustomed to. So huge resentment. And on top of that, what my parents explained to me as the reason for immigration, the American dream wasn't what it made to be. What I seen in reality was less time with parents, parents working long hours, they became mm. more stressful. So all of that was a different narrative to me, right? The whole thing looks very different. And then uh, on top of that, there was a shift in family dynamic where parents used to be the caregivers, but now they're just bringing financial needs home. Right. I became the translator. I became the navigator. In many ways, I became the clutch in the family, right? So that further drove, drove me away from my parents and into, into my friends, into friends that, that didn't know any better. So long story short, I got into a lot of trouble as a youth. And from that, it, it actually opened my eyes to know that my parents were the one that unconditionally loved me. So that actually uh, motivated me to do this work I do today, which is to give back to the community, people that I could relate to. But all I could say is the entire immigration process is, is very complex and it, it could hit people differently, right? And it's just with anything else. So it, 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 go ahead. And, and, and that, that story can be told from community to community to community, can't it, uh, Vanessa? I mean, that's, yeah. that's, we, we all have so much to share. We all have so much in common. Uh, Vanessa, you want to comment on, on this, this topic um, that, that is so fascinating? And Kyle, thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience and, and uh, you, Lua. Uh, Vanessa, you want to comment on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, at, at the end of the day, I know that, you know, we're all, 
we are all want to ensure that there's opportunities for every child and every young person to, to live to their fullest potential. We don't want to dictate what success may mean, you know, and, and, and keep, but it is something that, you know, that they can define for themselves. And I, you know, so you as, want to con- convey culture, but not restrict, right. As a parent, you don't want to place yeah. your child in a box. So you, you're trying to share. We want to create, right. And create, you know, those opportunities. I mean, I'm a mother of three young boys and, you know, I was, you know, my parents came after, after the 1965 immigration act, they came in 1968. Um, so I think I definitely different um, immigration experience. I was born here in this country, um, my three boys um, as well. And I think this this need to, you know, we also understand like when you're um, for so many immigrants, you're really just struggling for survival at times. Right. And I think I've come as, you know, being able to be born and raised in this country with a, a different perspective. But oftentimes there's not a lot of information about you know, what, what are the resources that are available for young people? You know, we want to make sure that our kids are successful. And oftentimes that only translates to financial stability. Um, But in essence, like, what is that, you know, we can't often have, like, you know, we've had our conversations with community groups, with immigrant families, when parents were like, I actually really, you know, we are, we're here, we immigrated to this country, we're struggling. But ultimately, we also want our children to be happy. Right. Um, and those conversations, like, and the kids themselves are like, this is the first time I've heard my parents actually say that, not worry about just my grades only. That this was actually, this is an opportunity. Like, I feel like there's been spaces that our communities are, inter, you know, connections intergenerationally need to happen, connections across communities. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's what safety means for communities is making sure that they have the resources um, and the support um, that they need to thrive. And, and so let me ask you a couple of, a couple of questions, and then we're going to go over some of the uh, poll results. Um, do you feel like there's, like we do a particularly good or bad job of just talking about the history of the various peoples in the in the United States, as as you're seeing your your kids being educated, and as you've experienced education yourself, do we really uh, help to convey knowledge? Are we actually systematically helping to bind the country together, or are we just ignoring a, a whole swath of history? And Kyle, I see you have a small smile on your face. Uh, so uh, see, it's dangerous to smile on this. Program. <laughs> uh, uh, what did you want to say? Uh- I, I want to end on a positive note, so I wouldn't say we're doing a terrible job. I think we're definitely getting there with the integration of uh, ethnic studies in, in many places, but I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, with my story of immigration, being a first-generation Asian-American in this country, I missed out the whole point uh, or the whole piece of internalized racism, right? I, for the longest time, I was embarrassed to go out with my parents. I didn't want to be seen with my parents, because I know they only speak Chinese. And when they speak Chinese, they don't just speak it. They speak it very loudly as if the neighbors couldn't hear. So, so for the longest time growing up, I, I was ashamed to be Chinese. I didn't want to identify. I didn't want to speak because I speak with an accent. I was very ashamed. And, and I had to deal with that for the longest time. So for me, I think it, it, it's important for us to teach history, not just white history, but history of everyone in America, right? So so we could all be prideful of something to know that, hey, we we did work here. Like Luau was saying, we didn't come to just take, we, we built stuff here. We, we, we left our footprints, but that just wasn't talked about. So people didn't know. So I think it's important to, to, to teach. But again, I want to end on a positive note. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. And I, I'm, I'm very confident about that. Well, part, is it, part of it is that, uh, Lua, is that, uh, and this is something that I've noticed, in my life, people never talked about the problems that um, communities face, particularly uh, uh, Asian communities, Pacific Islander communities, Hawaiian communities, Nobody talked about it within, within uh, outside of those communities. And the fact that these stories are being covered and covered prominently is, is a really important step uh, because now you take knowledge that has been promulgated within communities 
and you're sharing it across communities. Gail had uh, pointed out, uh, uh, Gail Kong had pointed out that that now allows communities to share. So you've got the ADL sharing with Asian communities, this idea of, of talking about about issues, talking about attacks, talking about defamation, talking about it as a very powerful first step of taking action. Um, and 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 so, you know, that's progress, isn't it? Or of, of a sort, perhaps it needs to accelerate, but, but we're getting uh, some additional traction that we didn't have before, aren't we? So Asia Pacific Culture Center was established 25 years ago uh, to bridge communities and generations through arts, culture, education, and business. So we teach and showcase and represent the 47 nations that make up all of Asia and all of the South Pacific. And we find out that so much of what's going on with the Asia Pacific people really need for all of us or as many of us to teach others about who we are. And so because so many people like teriyaki, uh, chicken and teriyaki beef, but they have no idea that it's Japanese, it's not Chinese. So many people like uh, the, the noodles, uh, uh, pho, but they have no idea it's Vietnamese. So the people in America need to know more about us. And that's what APCC does. But so we're going to the schools and Office of Instruction here in Washington State. And we've been working on this for a while, not just APCC, a, you know, a group of leaders of us, especially the ones in education. We want to teach Asia Pacific history in the schools. So that is surfacing and surfacing more and more that's one of the, our initiatives that we're working hard on in Washington State. Well, and you I know, know if you're when going I went to, excuse me for interrupting, but you make such an important point. If you're going to be a country that is inter, uh, that is actively connected to the world, if you're going to be doing business in Korea versus Japan, or you're going to be doing business in China versus the Philippines or in Vietnam or, or in in uh, the South Asian countries, uh, India and Pakistan and so on, you have to understand the distinctions. My goodness, you have to re show respect. You have to be knowledgeable. And yes. it's true no matter what you're, what you're doing. And what you're saying is get it together, America, because if you're going to be strong and you're going to be a world power, you're going to be economically thriving. This is, this is key. And, yes. you know, if we look at, if we look at some of the responses on the polls, it was very interesting. Um, 70% of the, of the respondents said that they were going to actually mark uh, this month um, uh, uh, the, um, the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month with some event. Maybe it's going to a restaurant with family or, or going to a cultural activity. Um, uh, also, and here's an interesting, 88% said that we're not doing a great job of educating on uh, API heritage in, in the public schools. And finally, this is really interesting. Where are the two places where API heritage, culture, art, history, and traditions are best conveyed to next generations? And this is interesting. We say we're not doing a great job, but 70% said that's the best place is in the schools, in education, in sort of integration. And then the second best place was uh, performing or visual arts. Mm -hmm. And the third was through food. So I think we got all of your points, uh, Lua, uh, included. Um, I'm going to uh, go back and give the last word to Kyle. Kyle, in terms of if, if you were um, advising from your perspective as a child coming to Hong Kong who has gone through this emotional arc and this experiential arc, uh, that you described, and thank you so much for sharing such a such a deeply personal experience with us. If you were going to advise us in terms of how we should change, all of us, all of us, you, me, people who are not watching this program as well, how should we try to create a better um, a better country, a better, more prosperous country um, by changing our behaviors in this respect? Thank you, Mark, for, for giving me a, a very tough question at the end. I, I, I would say 
stay trauma informed, be genuine. I think it's a very important that, that we spend the whole show kind of whole segment talking about how diverse the API community is. So it's really important for us to, to be trauma informed and to be genuine and to recognize that everyone is unique in their own sense. Even within the Chinese culture, there's a lot of subgroups. There's Toysanese, there's folks from mainland China, right? So everyone's unique in their own culture, right? How their race could have a big influence on who they are. So it's important to really get to know the person for who they are. And instead of making assumptions, just because you're Chinese, you must like this. Just because you're a uh, 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 islander, you must like this, right? So it's really getting to know the person for who they are and not make assumptions based on just first glance. I think that will take us a long way. What a great, what a great exit uh, for, for this fantastic di discussion. You're saying be empathetic, be human, constantly learn, embrace, be informed. Vanessa Leong, uh, co-executive director at the Asian American Coalition for Children and Families in New York. Kyle Kaifai Chan, uh, program director of the Community Youth Center of San Francisco and Lua Pritchard, Executive Director at the Asian Pacific Cultural Center in Washington. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for informing us. And, and we will try to do better, all of us, right? And in coalition, we will try to move forward to create um, the country that, that we ought to be. We will possibly never achieve it, but it is one of those efforts that enriches our lives. Thank you so much. Thank your boards. Thank your staff. Thank, thank you. Your your donors and stay healthy. Take care all. Bye.